All right, welcome to everyone who's joining us uh, for our publication success interview series today. Welcome in. Um, we'll, we'll get started here in about another minute or two. Uh, once everyone has, give everyone a chance to grab their coffees and uh, and and get comfy in their in their chairs wherever you may be. If it's cold outside, I hope you're keeping warm. Um, and uh, this is a great opportunity to kind of check in by the chat. Tell us who you are, uh, where you're, you know, where you're uh, joining us today from and uh, maybe a little bit about uh, your, your area of expertise or your field of research so we can get kind of a feel for who's joining us today. Um, so I'll try and get us started. Actually, just before we went on, um, Ellen uh, asked me where where the participants uh, will be joining us from today, and I always find it fascinating to see where people are checking in from, uh, because I think one of the great parts about Zoom is that we have the ability to really speak with, you know, really to, to be joined by scholars from around the world. Um, you know, there's uh, so long as you're willing to wake up or stay up uh, <laughs> long enough, uh, you're welcome to join us. For, for, for the event today or for any of the events that we do in the future. So uh, really exciting to see kind of the range of scholars that, that are joining us. Um, welcome to Rebecca, welcome Francine. I'm always impressed when we get someone from New Mexico. That means you, that means you woke up quite early, so. Uh, <laughs> So nicely done. Unless you're uh, unless you're working from from afar, Francine, I'm I'm always impressed uh, uh, to see West Coasters joining us. All right, brilliant. So everyone, please continue to feel free to uh, to share with us, uh, you know, uh, your information and where you're coming from and where you're joining us. And what what interests you? Um, it's also helpful when you know we have this discussion to kind of keep in mind uh, who who's who's here and um, and what they're interested in. Um, all right, so. Uh, I think I think it's time to get started. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, or good evening from wherever you may be joining us today. Uh, I can see already that we have scholars that are joining us really from around the world, uh, from the UK and the US, all the way to Pakistan and Slovenia and, and everywhere in between. So we're really uh, excited that you're joining us today. My name is Avi Stamen, for those who, don't, who haven't been to a previous uh, interview or don't know me already. Uh, and I am the CEO of a company called Academic Language Experts. Uh, this is the latest, today is the latest episode in our publication success interview series. And for those who don't know, the goal of this series is to interview uh, and having engaging conversations with innovative thought leaders in academia about how they are influencing the world of academic publishing in the hopes of trying to build a bridge between authors and publishers to make the whole publishing process uh, smoother and a better experience for authors. Uh, today, we're actually going to be continuing a conversation that we started last month, uh, which really got a lot of attention and excitement and response, and we decided to kind of follow up, have a follow-up session as a result um, on the topic of uh, writing for a popular audience and exploring how publishers can, I and so, so today we're kind of going to take it one step further and talk about how publishers go about identifying books with uh, potential for popular appeal. And obviously, if we can understand what publishers are interested in, then we as authors can uh, adapt accordingly. Uh, in order to make the session really as effective as possible, we've invited two really unique insiders uh, who will share their thoughts on this topic. Uh, the first is Ellen Khadash, uh, who is the director at NYU Press. Uh, and the second is Michael Sanaki, who's the publisher at Rutledge. Uh, Ellen was, so we'll start with Ellen. Ellen was named the director of New York University Press back in 2014, uh, and at the press, she oversees editorial, marketing, and business operations, so everything, it sounds like, uh, of the 105-year-old publishing company. Prior to joining NYU, uh, she held a variety of positions at Oxford Un University Press, including the vice president and publisher of the trade division, which is why uh, she's an excellent person to talk to us about trade books. Uh, Ellen is on the advisory board uh, of the Center for Publishing at NYU's School of Professor Studies and teaches a workshop in academic publishing. So Ellen, thank you for joining us today. Uh, our second guest is Michael Sanaki. Michael is a publisher at Rutledge, formerly part of Taylor Francis, 
and he oversees the Productivity Press imprint, uh, and that focuses specifically on business improvement books for professionals. For more than 25 years, uh, Michael has been acquiring cutting-edge books focusing on lean production and lean service, operational excellence, quality and Six Sigma, uh, product development, supply chain management, green manufacturing, sustainability, and quality improvement. So anyone in the field of organizational uh, management or behavior, this is, this is your man. Uh, please don't be shy. Ask your questions on the Zoom chat throughout the session. Uh, we will try and collate and organize the questions and address them at the end of the interview, so the last 10 minutes. So stick around and make sure you hear the Q&A. Uh, if you have a more personal question or want to discuss your specific research, you can reach out to us privately at info at ackling.com, and we will get back to you in the coming days. You also have my email up here on the screen. Uh, you're welcome to reach out to me at your convenience. Please note that the interview is being recorded, and we will send it to everyone who registered shortly after the event, whether you attend or not. Finally, before we begin, I would like to take a moment to share a word about the company that I run, Academic Language Experts. We provide customized language, grant writing, and publication support services to researchers, scientists, and other professionals to help them produce publication-ready texts at the highest levels. We also help scholars looking to, for help with their book proposals prior to submission to their dream publisher. So anything having to do with academia and writing and publishing and anything you may need help with, uh, feel free to reach out to see what we can do to help you. We're grateful and proud to have helped scholars translate, edit, and prepare their research in over 50 languages. Articles and books we have worked on have been published with top academic publishers around the world, including, of, including, of course, Routledge and NYU Press. It's our mission to help authors achieve publication success and be a source of guidance and support throughout their journey. And now with great excitement, I want to introduce you to Ellen and Michael. Um, Ellen and Michael, it's really great to have you here today. Thank you very, very much for joining me. Happy to be here. Yes, thank you for the invitation. Oh, it's my pleasure. I really appreciate you taking, I know you're both very busy and I appreciate you taking the time uh, out of your busy day. Okay, so just to get started, uh, a little bit of a warm up here. Um, I was hoping that you could both share with us a little bit about yourselves, uh, the publisher that you work for, um, and how you came to be in your current position. Ellen, maybe we'll, we'll start off with you. Okay. Um, well, honestly, my whole publishing career has been a happy accident. Um, I got a job at Oxford when I finished college. I was just looking for work, and that was where I landed. And it turned out that publishing was a business that I loved, and it suited me. And I was fortunate enough to be at a company that was growing, and I had a lot of opportunities to learn. Uh, so I was there for many years. Um, I came up through marketing, and I think my responses to the questions that you ask are probably going to reflect that marketing background. Um, and I became the publisher of the trade paperback line and then ultimately the trade division. Um, I left Oxford after reorganization and uh, became a uh, consultant for a little while. And then I was lucky enough to get the job at NYU Press as the director. And I think, you know, it was the fullness of my experience at Oxford that allowed me to move into a position like this at a much more traditional American university press. Yeah, and I, and I just want to jump in and add that I think that it shouldn't be understated the role of marketing in the book, you know, production process. I think maybe even more so than with journal articles, um, we tend to assume as scholars that our research is accepted or rejected based on the quality, and, and, and hopefully that is indeed true. However, to ignore the marketing aspects or elements of a proposal, I think, is, is maybe a bit naive. So, um, you know, I definitely think that that's, it's worth taking into consideration. Not only is this good scholarship, is it innovative, but also who is it going to interest and, um, you know, where, where could it potentially sell through? All right. Uh, yeah, Michael, uh, can you, yeah, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and, and you, specifically, I'm curious about your productivity press and kind of how that fits into the greater Routledge uh, brand and what, what you focus on. Sure. I've been working for productivity press for 30 years, believe it or not. <laughs> and um, productivity press was originally a smaller uh, family owned um, um, business and it was purchased by Taylor and Francis, uh, which is a, um, which oversees Rutledge in 2007. So um, I've been in publishing um, all of my career. I originally started working on uh, business journals when I first got out of college. And then I started working for um, Productivity Press. It was a mixture of 
company called Quality Resources, product, Productivity Press at the time. And I, um, I came in as a, as a project editor. And then, um, then I was a managing was editor. A managing and then after that, I, was, um, I, I got into acquisitions in the, um, in the mid-90s. And I've been acquiring books mainly for the professional audience since the mid 90s and the books that i acquire have always been not necessarily trade have always been uh business books or professional books in a sense that they're geared more towards something's very specific within business whether or not it's some type of initiative whether it's not it's some type of regulation or whatnot so a lot of times the books are selling in bulk to corporations because they're using them for either like training or some type of uh, management development within the organization. So professional publishing, a little bit more of that B2B, that business to business work, say more so than the trade where maybe the trade books will have a little bit more of that general management topic, say working with millennials, where you could put that on a book stand or you can put that at a Hudson's bookstore in in any airport. And that'd be something that someone would pick up where the books that I mainly focused on or a little bit more geared towards organizations looking to make improvements in, in very specific areas that were maybe weren't as general. Even though I do do some trade, the majority of my books are a bit more would fall in the professional line. So so Michael, I'm curious sort of as a follow-up to that, if um, you know, I imagine, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I imagine that at least some of the authors are have a strong academic background and kind of use that as a springboard to, you know, to specific industry fields. And I'm curious, how would you say, what, what would be the major differences in your eyes between uh, what would we would know as a typical academic book that would be published maybe for the academic community and an academic who maybe wanted to bring their insights based on their research to the business world? What is the difference, like, how, what what is the difference between those two proposals or those two books? What is the, you know, how do we kind of differentiate and make it clear what's what each one is? The best proposals that I get for academics that are looking to say break into the professional market is a lot of times they'll align themselves, they'll write the book with someone that's out in the market, maybe with a consultant or 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 whatnot um, that's out there um, on the ground, you know, working within companies or whatnot. And the difference that separates the proposals is that a lot of times academics, I think, are the academic proposals are more geared towards citations and theory and methodology where with the professional pro proposals that I like, you have to put yourself in the position of the audience. Usually it's some type of manager or, or someone in the position that's charged with maybe overseeing a team or overseeing some type of initiative. So they want the book to be as practical and tactical as possible. They don't want to see a lot of footnotes. They don't want to hear, like, especially if I'm doing some type of book on say like a lean initiative or a six sigma uh, a six sigma initiative they don't necessarily want the whole background of toyota and the history of toyota or motorola or what was happening in motorola in 1990 they want something very specific as far as this is how it was applied to say a specific industry a process industry or something like that so the books are a lot more tactical with the academic books, I think, have a tendency to like button up more as far as get the research straight, get the get the citations um, correct, make sure it's it's peer reviewed by by um, uh, by respected folks um, in that area and then and things like that. Great. Thanks so much, Michael. Ellen, would do you would you say that it's a similar distinction when it comes to trade books and trade publishing in terms of some of the things that Michael mentioned in terms of cutting down on footnotes and maybe getting to the point a little bit sooner? Or are there other things that may distinguish trade books that are published through an academic press as opposed to your typical monograph? Well, you know, at an academic press, even the trade books go through peer review. So um, there does need to be, you know, that kind of scholarly heft to it. Um, but I think I, it's, I definitely agree with Michael. You don't need so much citation you don't have to prove that you're in command of the research the way that you do when you're publishing a book that's going to count towards your tenure or promotion or if you're defending a dissertation. What, what a good, strong trade proposal does is it makes a very clearly stated argument and, and presents a point of view, which an academic book tends to be a little bit more neutral in its coverage. Um, but your 
talking, you're sharing an idea with the general audience, and you're going to lead them through your thinking in your writing to get them to the payoff, um, you know, of whatever your new idea is or your, or your new view of an event that took place or some theory that people want to try to understand. But it's a strong argument and point of view is what needs to show up in the proposal. Yeah, it's interesting because I think in certain ways it's a challenge because we're as academics we're sort of used to we're we're sort of used to being having the luxury of being able to to spread you know our 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 theory and our literature review over hundreds of pages and sometimes that doesn't exactly work uh, for something that's going to be more of a popular title. But in many ways, maybe it it allows us to you know it. it there's not there's not always a calling into question of our credentials or if we've cited every single last uh, you know uh, uh, source in our in our literature review exactly in the way that it was it was intended and maybe in that way it actually makes things a bit easier. Um, so you know I, I I think there can be challenges to writing in a new way or a new form, but there can also be uh, distinct advantages uh, to that as well. Um, yeah, go ahead. Elle. No, I was just going to say, you know, you don't have to feel as an academic writer, you don't have to feel that you have to dumb things down for a general reader. People are really willing to engage with difficult subject matter. You just have to be prepared to give them a context that your scholarly colleagues already have, who, which a general reader might not have. Yeah, yeah, and I think that also the, that point of picking up on who the reader is, right? I think especially, I find this a lot in our work with more junior scholars, um, scholars who are just finished up their PhDs and they're writing to prove to three individuals, uh, their three advisors that they know their topic and they've covered it from start to finish and they haven't missed, they, they haven't left any rock unturned. Whereas your typical, you know, average reader says, I, I trust you. There's a certain level of, right? I, I, you, you, you know, you've proven your credentials to me. I don't need you to tell me every single theory and why you disagree with each one. Tell me what you think. Tell me what you understand. Uh, at one time, there was a head of a press who compared it to, um, to the opposite of a novel, right? If a novel were waiting to the last chapter in order to figure out what the twist is, here we want to tell people right at the very beginning, here's what I'm going to teach you. Here's how I'm going to teach it to you in a very clear and, and, and coherent way. Um, and in that way, um, you know, really provide you with the value, which makes you actually want to pick up the book and read it. Um, so anyway, um, now I want to, I, I'm curious because I've noticed sort of anecdotally, I've noticed this trend towards uh, more sort of a blurring of the lines. Uh, I'm curious, I definitely have noticed this in, in academia where more academics are trying to write uh, popular books or more books, or what I would call uh, popular intellectual thought or um uh, brainy, brainy nonfiction uh, is catching catching on uh, within the academic community, um, and so I'm curious whether you've noticed a similar trend. Also, Michael, in the business world, do you, have you seen that more academics are trying to write their, uh, you know, write books that are that are business oriented or, or oriented for the business community? And if you have noticed this trend, or if you think it's been around the whole time, uh, what do you think about it? What do you think the pluses and minuses are for the world of scholarship? Do you think that it's, you know, uh, generally a positive, uh, you know, a positive thing? Or do you think there are certain drawbacks that we need to be aware of that, that you know, we shouldn't go too far and, and get overexcited about? I'll jump in. For me, I think um, I have seen that. Speaking for my audience, um, it's, I think it's always a little bit tough for the academics to make that jump. Um, a lot of times because the audience that I'm appealing to, if they're picking up a particular book, if they have, if they, if they're just say they're going on Amazon and they're just searching through books and they say, you know what, I'm charged with this. I need to find information. I know my, I know how my audience works. They're looking for a book that's written by someone closely like what they're doing. Oh, this is written by another manager in a company like this. This person was in my position this many years ago. And I know that's what helps with what, 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 what sells a lot of books. I think the academics, I think, can break in there if they, like you said, they speak a little bit more directly to that audience. They know who their audience is. Or they know who they're trying to hit. And I think it's actually better to be very, to get, specific as possible than to just try to cast like this wide net and try to speak to 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 um, 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 a, a lot of folks because I've noticed that 
with my audience, a lot of times they're looking at like, oh, well, who wrote this? Is this someone that I can, oh, this person was a manager at 3M Corporate. Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, this is what I'm going through right now. So I think that's, that's what speaks to the audience. Um, I think this is a trend that has always existed. It's probably uh, increased a bit the desire to be more of a public intellectual than merely to be seen as a college professor. Um, and I think that's good. You know, I mean, people who are in the academy are the people who are creating new ideas. And if we can extend their ability to share those ideas with the public, that's all to the good. I think social media and Amazon have hastened this because when you go on Amazon, the reader has no idea if a book is a trade book or an academic book. They're finding it because they're searching for a topic and uh, this, the distinction is not clear to them. You know, that's kind of an inside baseball kind of distinction. And as a result, I think publishers um, are being a little bit more attentive now to how they present academic material. The covers of the books are better, the titles are better thought out, the promotional copy is a little bit more geared to, um, you know, a general audience than it used to be. So it's expanding the audience, even for the most academic work. That's really fascinating. I never thought about it in that way before, that from the audience's perspective, these terms that we're throwing out, these distinctions that we're making between trade book and business book and academic book, uh, I think, you know, we have to remember that people will pick up and read a book either because it's in their area of interest or because it's a need of theirs. Let's say what if it has to do with business. I'm just thinking about the books that I read, you know, I put off the shelf and they don't necessarily say, you know, is it a purely, you know, academic book or is it not an academic book? Rather, they'll say, of what interest is it to me and does it capture my attention? So I think, you know, that maybe that's a more important uh, question that scholars need to be asking themselves. Um, how do I narrativize uh, what it is that I'm doing and turn it into some sort of story with some sort of beginning, middle and end, even if right, it may be easy to do if I'm writing a history book, but it may be more difficult if I'm writing, you know, uh, a, a business book. And how do I turn that into, you know, a, a story that can re that, that the reader can relate to? And in that way, it's sort of less important how we what category we put it in, um, but rather you know, is it of interest? I mean, one one individual once told me that he he sent he specifically sends his research to his family members who are not academics to kind of see could they make it to the end of the article, right? Was it <laughs> what does it, it was it interesting to them as someone who you know was intelligent but you know not necessarily an expert in the field um, and kind of gauge their response. So maybe that's a good sort of easy low cost way of of, of doing this. Um, mm. I was hoping that each of you can share sort of in general, what types of in manuscripts, you know, kind of jump out at you. And maybe to make the question a little bit more tangible, is there a project that you've worked on recently um, that you can share with us that you, that, you know, kind of caught your attention, was something that was a bit different or stood out or, you know, really jumped off the page to the point where you said, oh, you know, this is something new, this is something innovative um, and, and, and has the potential to kind of uh, uh, do well. So Ellen, maybe we'll start with you on this one. Uh, sure. Well, NYU Press um, is a humanities and social science publisher <clears throat> exclusively. We nibble around the edges of science, but whenever it's a topic, it's always like blah, blah, and society. If you can tack and society onto it, then that's a book that NYU Press can do. Um, we tend to focus on contemporary issues. Our biggest and most successful list is in sociology. So we're always looking at contemporary social problems. And there's a very strong thread in terms of topic. Uh, race, class, and gender is kind of a thread that goes through all of the disciplines we publish in. So we're looking for fresh research. We're often a little bit ahead of the curve because you know, researchers are working on things that may not have hit the popular imagination yet, but it is our job to you know, build the scholarly record. Um, but we also do books that like, are a little bit off to the side. And one of the projects that I worked on recently is called uh, Are the Arts Essential? And it came to me, someone at the university asked me as a favor if I would talk to these people who had convened a conference of artists and museum directors and critics to discuss the role of the arts writ large 
um, in society and what role they could play in sort of rebuilding our world after a pandemic. And, you know, we were not committed to publishing it. I was just really trying to help them out as a favor. And over the course of two years, they got funding and they convened other conferences. And finally, they came to us with this collection of essays by these unbelievably distinguished people who were so eager to address this because the arts are always pushed to the side. You know, they don't get the funding they deserve. They don't get the attention they deserve about how they can rebuild civilization, really. So it's coming out for us in February. We're so excited about it because we feel it's a, a real contribution um, and also beautifully, beautifully written. So keep your eye out for it. On sale soon. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And one, one takeaway that I have from that is that Sometimes maybe we need to think a bit bigger than our specific research question. If I were to guess this researchers, um, you know, who's, who initiated this, uh, this collection probably studies a more specific topic than, you know, the arts, uh, you know, the arts in the world in general. But she understood her opportunity to be able to take a forum that she created to turn it into a much larger question where I'm sure she contributes something of, you know, uh, important to the collection but yet still at the same time sort of opens it up for others to be able to contribute in their own way and, and actually tackle a much broader and larger topic than she may have been able to do on her own. Michael, you wanna, you wanna chime in and a, a project that you took on recently that, or that you, you know, a, a proposal that really, you know, kind of struck you? Sure, I think just to back up a bit, I think when it comes to proposals, what I'm, what I'm always looking for, I think in the proposals is like, of, of course the author's background and their, I guess ability or their or their background to speak on the topic is important. But what I like seeing in a proposal is when an author has made a real effort to understand the market, where this book is going to fit and why it's unique, as opposed to saying, well, I have the background to write on this subject, but sort of in a vacuum, well, it's like, well, have do you know what else is out on the market? What's already been out there, even though you have this background? Just the idea of you writing on this topic doesn't necessarily mean it's going to sell. Where is the unique factor? What, what, what is it adding? What is this building on? Where would this fit compared to other books? Maybe what would this book be um, accomplishing that's maybe not a, that's not um, already out there in the in, in the lit, in the literature currently? So that's what I look for in the proposal. Proposal recently got a uh, book that I recently published that I thought was very, very interesting was on um, a, a book about branding. Um, and the way branding has transformed um, um, over the years and how just previously you were able to, to live off a brand for a lot longer. You were actually able, the slope of a declining brand, you were actually able to ride that a lot longer now, where now brands change so quickly and even the interpretation of brands. And a lot of that goes into the, the, um, the, the, the audience interpretation and what's happening with, with the brand itself and how quickly things can change. And I think one of the uh, examples is just, you know, right now we're in 2021. If it was 2010, we can poll the 75 people that are listening right now. And they probably have, a lot of people would have a Nokia phone in their pocket, in their pocket at the time. Now it's like, is, can you find a Nokia phone? You know, so it's, it's, it's things like that, how quickly, you know, brands can change and the, and the, and the public, um, uh, the, the public, I guess, um, interpretation of brands and how they go off brands and how brands are, um, are embraced. And I, and I recently have a book that, that, that came out and I found that to be, um, to be very interesting. Yeah. One, one company that just comes to my mind when talking about this is AOL, right? Like 15 years ago, you would have thought AOL is at the forefront of, you know, of, of, of everything having to do with internet and technology, maybe the most, you know, iconic brand out there. And now I can tell you that if I see, you know, someone, an email come in from an AOL email address, I assume the individual is at least 55 years old. Now, maybe that's, I should not do that and I shouldn't <laughs> stereotype, but I, that's my assumption because most people have, you know, moved on to, 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 to other brands. So yeah, I think that that point is well taken about, you know, how 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 these how these things evolve? Uh, uh, Russell in the in the chat recommended uh, uh, the book proposal book, uh, which is re recently written by Laura Portwood Stacer. The only reason I mention it is because 
Uh, Laura will be our guest in May. So I, I encourage everyone to tune in for that as well, because she really, it's a great book. Um, uh, I just got it a few weeks ago and I recommend it as well. Uh, it kind of goes through some of the topics that, that we're discussing here today. Um, so maybe Michael and Ellen, you can just expand a little bit and talk about what are some of the telltale, I, I think, you know, Michael, you started us off really nicely in talking about some of the telltale signs about a book that you would identify as, you know, what we'd call, I guess, a breakthrough book or a book that could move beyond. And, and one of the great, one of the really important things to do is to try and, you know, really spot your audience. You know, sometimes when I encourage scholars to do this, they'll say, oh, my audience is all scholars in the field of literature. Well, it's like, well, that's a little bit too broad. Or if the audience is, uh, you know, John Doe, professor of literature at, you know, NYU, well, that's a little bit too specific, right? How do we, you, you have to kind of put yourself into the publisher's shoes and say, how, you know, if I were going to have to take 10 trips or or send 10 emails, right, who would I send them to, uh, people who could really get this book out there? And this kind of relates back in full circle to what Ellen was saying at the beginning about marketing is that we do need to think, as even as authors, about, because we may know who our audience is better than, than the press does. We assume the press knows, but but we actually may know in the best way possible. So the better we can define that, the better it is. But um, Michael and, and Ellen, I'm wondering if there are other telltale signs of books that you say to yourself or, or certain shared characteristics of books that you say, you know what, this has potential to, again, move beyond just the typical academic monograph and actually have an impact uh, in the field. So Ellen, maybe you could talk about this, uh, start us off and talk about this in the, you know, within the context of an academic book. How do you kind of make that division between a book that's just a typical monograph that NYU you might want to publish and maybe a book that you say, oh, this has trade potential and, and, and maybe we should push it out that way? Um, I don't know if NYU is unusual in this, but we often don't make that kind of publishing decision until after the manuscript comes in. But you can look at a proposal and say, ah, this topic looks like it has potential. But until you see how the author actually executes it, what the writing is like, uh, we tend not to make the commitment to say that this is going to be on our trade list versus our academic list. And the truth of the matter is that for us, our sweet spot are often these books that surprise us, that um, they look like academic books when they come in and then something happens out in the world that makes the interest in them explode beyond what we you know, ever could have imagined. I mean, we had uh, a book, it was clearly you know, academic on uh, racial in inequality in healthcare and uh, the very poor outcomes in, in neonatal units for women of color. And it, it was a fantastic book. It was deeply researched. The author had excellent credentials. All of a sudden comes, um, you know, the pandemic. And you started to see the inequality in healthcare and how people's treatment and outcomes were different. And although it was not about babies, the pandemic, this was like a micro look at what it looks like inside a hospital when people of color come and don't get the same level of treatment as anybody else. And the book just completely exploded. It was something we never could have predicted. We knew it was a fine piece of work, but we had no idea that it would end up selling the way that it did. And you know what I love about that example, Ellen? And these are my favorite books. My favorite books are books that take a very contentious topic that is that is generally talked about in very what I would call thin terms right it's generally talked about sort of you know arguments over the Thanksgiving table you know about where you know people's politics lie and it adds a layer of research sophistication uh, complexity uh, to the discussions that we have so that instead of just you know kind of throwing empathy you know throwing insults one another or or, or just getting up on our high horse, we can actually um, in, inform ourselves about the, the the important questions and and actually how they affect real people on a on a broad scale. So that's kind of like, and I, and I think like what's wonderful about that is it's actually doing good good for the world, but it's also at the same time, you know, a book that has potential to really sell quite well. So that's another thing is thinking about within you know our research. Like you said, you know, if I would have told you that three years ago, you know, uh, uh, you know, disease control specialist would be the most sought after uh, <laughs> interviewees in the world, you would say, uh, uh, you know, I don't think, you know, you'd, you'd 
probably call me crazy. So, you know, it, 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 you know, there is timing and obviously timing is an important factor here as well. But I think that trying to give a certain level of sophistication to a topic that people do talk about, but maybe aren't necessarily informed on the, the, the sort of more finer details can really be, can really be a contribution. Um, my, my goal is there, is there, uh, can, can, can you add to that from, from your perspective? Sure. I think a lot of times if I'm dealing with academic proposals and the academic thinks there is a uh, market for it in, in, in the business world. What I do like to see from the academic where they will bring in the proposal, will they will cite, oh, but this was just discussed maybe in Industry Week or Harvard Business Review, where they're tying it into, I think, the, the, the business market, or better yet, they'll come to a proposal and they'll have an endorsement set by a, a business person that has already read the manuscript and the, the, the endorsement will come with almost framing the manuscript on why they feel this is going to be um, um, important um, in that area. Because I think a lot of times with, with academics, I think they get under the misconception, like you said, where, oh, this has a broader audience, publisher, this is a business book, what can you do with it? And it really doesn't come down to, because a lot of times you know, with, my, with the professional books, it's the author that's selling the book just as much as the topic. And a lot of times folks like to see that the author is visual, uh, that, it, that they're out there, they're, 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 they're on, they're doing podcasts, they're doing seminars, they're out there doing training, they're, they're engaged in there. So, because again, I think, like I said, a lot of the audience has so much to choose from. They can get to the information, but when they're, they they look up the books, say on Amazon, and they, they have a choice between six or seven books, and they're doing a quick search inside, or they're doing, oh, who endorsed this, or what's the blurb, you have only a few seconds to, to, to have them say, okay, this is the book that, 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 that they want. And I think if they look in and they just see it like it's too academic or they don't see the business angle, they're going to pass it by. They're going to be like, oh, well, no, that's, that's not something I'm going to be able to adapt with my team or training or at this location or, 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 or such. So I think, I think that's, I think that's very important where the, the academic, if they're, if they're, truly um, looking to break the book into a business market that they're making a lot of the effort up front as opposed to just saying, well, I think this could sell in, in, in business. So I'm going like to ask you a very frank question then to, for both of you, because I was surprised to hear a, a, a publisher, uh, not, not, you know, not either of you, but um, someone saying that the first thing they check is the social media profile or the online presence of the particular author before they even delve deeply into the proposal. Now, um, I want to be careful because I don't want to imply that we should, you know, that scholars should be, you know, fleeing the uh, the, the libraries and and running to to their Facebook pages and just focusing on that the entire time. Um, but I wonder to what extent it plays a determining role, or at least you know, opens a door if you do see that someone has a significant presence. Uh, in their field uh, beyond, you know, their, the 30 scholars that, you know, are, are interested or in their, on their specific listserv? We, we look, if we look, but it's really, it doesn't have an impact usually on our publishing decision, unless it's meant to be a trade trade book where we're going to be dependent on the author to do publicity and promotion. We want to see, you know, kind of what kind of chops they have. Um, but for the most part, our authors, we actually teach them how to use social media after we sign them up. It's, it's often the reverse. Michael? If I have a professional author who's looking to break, who's making the argument that the book should be breaking into trade, that's something that I'm going to be looking at. Because again, when it comes to that pure trade book, you cannot have a successful book without a successful author. The author's got to be on the ground. And again, a lot of the trade authors, the, the traditional trade authors, the book is just part of a larger brand. They're selling their larger brand and the book is just part of it. And so if they're going to do that, you want to see that. You want to see that, you know, because we're going to be focused on the content and we're going to be able to get the content out in front of the audience. But as far as like the author pedigree, that's going to be built up by the author. And the more so if an author's like trying to push this to trade and we're going to be pricing the book lower or we're going to be, you know, spending money to get it into 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 certain markets, 
we got to make sure that 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 author. So I will I will be checking that. I I often check that a lot to see what the author's presence is, especially if they're looking to push a professional book more towards the trade. Got it. Got it. Okay. And I think and one piece of advice that I try to give as often as possible is that you know it can be very intimidating when we think about all the different fora that are out there online to present ourselves. And I know I made this mistake of trying to you know, being a king at all of them. And I, I think that's a mistake. I think that it's enough to have a following in one. You have a very strong blog. That's great. You have a very strong Facebook presence. That's great. You're, you know, you've got, you're active on Twitter. That's great. But you don't need to do all of them. In fact, you're probably not going to be good at doing all of them. And, and your research may not be relevant for all of them. Um, so kind of figure out where your niche is, figure out where people are having these conversations, where you can interact in a meaningful way, and then just focus on that. And then you don't need to necessarily be wasting time, you know, building a presence. We're not talking about ads and you know, doing things artificially, just organically, try to figure out where you can engage in the most serious way. Um, and actually, you know, hopefully, you know, make a real community for yourself, which will help you for your research as well, even if, even if uh, you know, it's not massive. Um, and now I want, I'm curious whether, um, you know, sort of in the submissions, well, a two, two part question. Um, I'm, I, I tend to ask these too often, two part questions, but uh, first of all is, at what stage in the process do you want people to be approaching you? Um, meaning, is it just when people have an idea? Or do they need to have a full first draft of their manuscript yet? Somewhere in between. Um, and then second of all, when people do approach you, what are some of the things that get under your skin or some of the things that are tell, that are, are not to do? So meaning things that you would tell authors that to avoid, uh, that you see a lot of that kind of maybe, you know, are telltale signs that this author is not ready or it's not going to be, you know, a good fit with your press. So Michael, oh yeah, Ellen, go ahead. I'm going to give this one to Michael because I don't okay, use no the manuscripts, yeah. Oh, okay. For me, it, well, that's that's actually a pretty broad question because I like speaking to folks at all stages. It, you know, like a lot of times I'll meet somebody, say, at a, at a conference and they're presenting and they're thinking about uh, developing the book. I know it's years down the road, though. But it's that's the initial contact where maybe they'll throw some ideas off me as they're still thinking about developing a proposal. And that's fine. Um, when it comes to submitting an actual proposal, though, I don't need a full manuscript. Again, I like a very complete proposal. I'll actually provide a proposal guideline. And if they can uh, comprehensively answer the questions that I have in the proposal, that's great. And if they can supply some sample, maybe a chapter or two, that that's that that's fine that gives me enough they distill their thoughts it gives me enough to go on just to see if it's something that i want to pitch inside if in, inside my company if i feel that it's um that it's that it's ready but as far as speaking to authors it can be speaking to them at any at any stage because a lot of times someone that i'm meeting now is a proposal two years from now you know so 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 that's fine what i don't like to see um I think that one of the one of the the, the major um, um, problems with um, with proposals, I think especially with um, professional books that are trying to break into trade, is the oversell. Like you said, where it's where someone will just state there are there are forty three thousand biochemists and blah blah blah, and so like all of a sudden that's like they'll be selling as like as that's the audience like. Well, okay, you know, like a, that oversell or that that person that feels their background is what's going to, in a sense, sell them speaking on the particular topic without saying what the material, why the material in their book is unique in the market or what it's adding. Again, if, if they can't speak about other material that's already out in the market about the topic that they're dealing with, that's a red flag for me because I almost feel and they created this book in a vacuum and they don't know what's popular out there, what's been adopted, what, um, what, what's been critically acclaimed, you know, and, and, and things like that. Yeah, I, I, just to add to what you're saying, um, what I find interesting is that in many cases, I think we get pushed in the academic world very hard to have novel research, right? That's, I mean, that's the name of the game, right? If our research is not novel, then it's not worth publishing. Um, but I think that at times, maybe academics take that too far and don't really take advantage of entering into active and, and engaging discourse with previous scholarship or previous ideas. And and, and, and I'm not talking about a literature review where we show 
okay, I know everything that's out there. It's actually taking an idea that said previously seriously, explaining it, and then explaining why your concept either builds on that or disagrees with it or, or, or sees it in a different way. And that way, the author, I think, first of all, I think it builds a certain level of credibility with the author that you're open to other ideas and showing what's come before. And you're showing that you're another step in the process. And especially if those authors have been, you know, either mentioned or a focal point in previous books that have come out with Rutledge or come out with NYU, then I think it's an easier sell because you're actually saying, we're continuing a conversation that we know you're interested in because you've already published about it. We have something new and unique to say about this discussion that we think is, is, is meaningful enough because it is new, but yet it actually is a topic that is that we know it has been engaged with prior. I actually think sometimes those can be really compelling um, uh, books. So sometimes, you know, not to fall into that trap of I have to do something, you know, that is totally radically new, you know, to the point where no one's ever even thought about it before. That's a really good point, Avi. And I have to say that one of the things that stands out to us in proposals is when the author looks like they've actually engaged with our publishing program and will mention comparable books. I mean, not necessarily competitive books, but something that shows that they understand the direction that our press is trying to go in. Um, and also secondarily, this is where peer review is often very useful because the peer reviewers will point out like, look, there's a literature and you're just not engaging with it at all. And here, here are things that you should be looking at to make your work stronger. It makes yeah. you stronger yeah. rather than weaker. Yeah, I agree. And, and in that context, I, I'm curious, you know, my, my uh, experience, my anecdotal experience has taught me also that trying to find a series to, to insert your book into can be a very helpful tool as well. Maybe both of you could take a minute. I know this is sort of off the cuff. It wasn't in what we prepared, but I'm curious if you could just talk about how you see, you know, manuscripts within series. Maybe you could even go a little bit into behind the scenes about does that, do you sell books on as individual individual books or maybe you sell them as part of the series? Like how does that, how does a book fit within the grander picture of, of what you do? Um, I have a love-hate relationship with series to be perfectly honest. Okay. And I think that's partly because of my trade background, but they've proven to be extremely valuable when you're trying to build a list and you wanna have some heft and, and um, extra support from a scholar in the field who knows who the people are who are working in these areas. I would say 90% of our series are populated by books that our series editors find. It isn't that we shoehorn a book into the series after the fact, although we do do it occasionally. Um, it, it's a market, we do, that's a hard question to answer. I guess we do both things. We do market series as a whole, but we do tend more to um, market our books as individual titles, just with under an umbrella of a particular topic that a series covers. Got it. For me regarding series, what is, oh, again, this is what's worked, I think, best for me. It seems as though I'll get an author the best books that are added to the series are authors who actually come in and say, I know this series and I think this would be a good book to be to be added to it. Um, it's rare that I ever find myself pushing something into um, into a series. There's usually a series editor. But if I get something that's not coming through the uh, through the series editor, the best ones are always like the authors have been like, you know, I've read three books from this series and I think this is a what should be added to this series. And then their proposal is based on making the argument on why, um, on why the book should be added to the series. That's, that's what's always worked um, most successfully for me. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And I think both with books and with journals, one of the things that I, when, when authors do come to me, and, and this is something that we do, we will help them prepare uh, you know, a, a list of publishers that may be relevant. But I always tell them the first thing they should do, aside from checking their own bibliography to see whether it's relevant, is to look at the titles that have come out, you know, from 2018 through today and see kind of, you know, that will give you the best idea, not only of what is what is the press interested in, but where are they heading? Like where is the, you know, where is the emphasis at? And if your book has little in common with anything that's been put out over the last three years, 
then I think you need to do a second thought and say, okay, well, do I really think mine is so groundbreaking that even though it's new and unique, it will be accepted? Or maybe this is a sign that I should be looking elsewhere, that there are other presses that are more interested or, or, or more relevant for my particular research. Um, so that's great. I want to finish up with one last question, uh, sort of uh, specifically geared towards maybe more of our uh, more junior scholars and, and, and you know, age doesn't matter, but scholars, you know, kind of looking into the future of the next 10, 15 years. Um, what do you see as the trends that are happening in your fields that are going to, you know, kind of disrupt the publication uh, industry? I know that, you know, uh, things that come to mind, such as open access, um, have made a big, big difference. Um, but what are some of the things that you see in your field, uh, maybe more digital publishing, uh, things that you could speak to as, you know, if you are a scholar who's maybe on the, the, the front end of their career, uh, that they should be considering when planning out their publications over, the, you know, for the next five, 10 years. Michael, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll start with you. I know it's a big question. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. No, uh, that, that's, um, that, that's no problem. I think, I think what's happened, uh, what's been happening a lot over the years um, is with publishers and what publishers have to be aware of is that when I was coming up in publishing, you were looking at the brand, the publisher brand, just as much as you were looking at the book. I don't think younger folks consider the brand as much. I don't think they really care where the book is is coming from because the way the way they they discover uh, material now. I think what's going to happen is that going forward, one of the things that's going to disrupt publishing, and I'll, I'll you know I'll state this very plainly as being in the industry so long is that publishers have to realize they're going to have to partner more with authors because I think author, it used to be, you want to get something published, you had to go to a publisher. There are so many options for, for, for authors now, as far as like self-publishing and, 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 and things like that. And so I think what happens is that author, uh, uh, publishers can't stay in, well, this is the, the model and the contract that we've had since 1998. So let's just keep following that because they're going to, if, if, if you can't sell the value of, of a publisher to the author within a minute and a half, then you can't sell it. You know, you can't, if you need, okay, I'm going to, or I'm going to tell you why it's important for you to publish with me. Let me, let me give you, give me an hour. No, I've got to be able to give it to them in a, in a, in a, in a, in an elevator ride, you know, the classic elevator ride and say, this is the value that we add. And you got, you have to understand what the, um, what's valuable to the, uh, to the authors, um, as well. So for me, what I see as the major disruption is the bypass of publishers. If publishers don't stay up responding to the needs of the authors, if I'm running a consulting company and previously I would go to a, a publisher and say, OK, my consultants, we're going to publish a series or something with this publisher. Now, since the tools are um, available, maybe I'll start my own little publishing division within my consulting business, I'll start my, and that's, and that's good enough for me. I don't need to sign away, you know, 80% of the net uh, royalties, you know, as, as I traditionally do. I don't, I don't, I don't need that anymore because the publisher isn't providing uh, what they used to provide. Maybe they're just trying to rely off a reputation. So I feel that being like worst case scenario where the value of publishers isn't, isn't really seen as, as it, as it, used to. So I think publishers have to change their models to like partner more with, with authors than just to say, well, here's our contract and this is, this is what we do. You know? So, yeah. Fantastic. Ellen? Well, the reason I was smiling was because I'm the person who 20 some odd years ago sat in a meeting and said, eBooks are not going to go anywhere. So I wouldn't put a lot of stake <clears throat> in my ability to see the future really. Um, you know, in academic publishing, uh, we worry less. I definitely, what Michael is saying is correct. You know, the publisher's role is definitely going to change. But as long as peer review remains an important part of the academic process, we're a little less worried about self-publishing and things like that. <clears throat> I would say to, um, you know, people in the beginning of their careers, do, do what you need to do to secure your job. If it's publishing monographs, great. You know, don't worry about the trade book until maybe a little bit later in your career. 
and think about whether in the field you're working in, if the trend is starting towards having to do digital enhancements of the text, because the technology does exist among university press publishers to publish in a different way so that you can have more interactive, if it's appropriate for your work, you know, interactive features and functionality. It doesn't just have to be a book book. Uh, the one thing I think is not gonna change and, and it does constantly surprise me is that, you know, human beings have a desire to understand the world around them. And academics are the people who are creating that knowledge and who have the ability to teach it to them. And if you just keep it in, keep that in mind, it's a very promising future, no matter what the delivery system is gonna be. People want to know what you know. And uh, I personally believe that inside of every monograph is a trade book. There's, a, there's an idea that if you tease it out, you can share with everybody. Interesting. Fantastic. That's great. Thank you so much. Uh, both Ellen and Michael, I really appreciate you, you really provide a lot of insights. And I was, to be honest, uh, I'll, I'll give a, a, a window into the back end. Um, when we were planning this event, I was a bit concerned that it would be too much of a repeat of, of, of last month in terms of the topic. But really, you added you know, all sorts of really fascinating ideas and, 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 and interesting you know, concepts to ponder that I that, that we didn't discuss this month, and I think we we could probably do it next month and do it again. So that, that I really appreciate and, and thank you for for your time and effort, um, uh, Alana. If you can uh, if you can bring up uh, just quickly, uh, if anyone wants to reach out and be in touch, uh, either with Ellen uh, or Michael, uh, we'll momentarily be putting onto the screen uh, our contact information. Uh, actually, all right, let's do the opposite. Yeah, there we go. Okay, brilliant. Um, so if you do have more personal follow-up questions that you want to reach out to, uh, both Ellen and Michael were kind enough to give their personal email addresses. You can reach out to them. You're also always welcome to reach out to me, uh, and check out, uh, our website as well in case, uh, that's of interest. That's in addition to the links that were shared, uh, during the course of the event. Uh, we've got a few really, really what I think are fascinating, uh, events coming up over the next few months, uh, which I invite you to take part in. Uh, so, uh, coming up next month. Uh, we're going to be talking about a topic that I really have wanted to talk about for a very long time, and that's linguistic bias uh, and talking about language, uh, the role of language in publication. Uh, and we're going to be, uh, I'm going to be hosting uh, two professors who wrote a book with Rutledge, so there you go, Michael, um, uh, having to do with uh, dis uh, linguistic discrimination in U.S. higher education and sort of uh, um, one of the authors calls it the last form of discrimination that's, that's actually, um, you know, seeps into our, into our academic world. So I don't know if that's true or not, but I, I think it'll be a fascinating conversation, uh, both for, uh, native English scholars who may need, you know, including myself who may need a little bit more sensitivity to understanding what the experience of non-native scholars are. Uh, and as well as non-native English scholars who, who, you know, this is an opportunity to really uh, share some of some of your experiences and, and talk about that. Uh, in January, we're going to be hosting uh, Ivan Aransky, who's the co-founder of Retraction Watch. Uh, for those who don't know Retraction Watch, uh, they um, are the hawk that oversees and makes sure that uh, that science that isn't really that you know science that's been disproven or that's uh, been questioned uh, is retracted by the different journals and different publishers. Uh, I guess you know they're they're they're, they're sort of uh, the overseers on that. He's a fascinating individual. I encourage. Um, to sign up for that as well. Uh, Alana, if you could leave the uh, the link to that in the chat, uh, then people can go ahead and sign up already now. Um, all right, so that's that's in terms of the next uh, the next uh, next couple months, upcoming events. Uh, I'd be happy to have you. Uh, I want to finish off with a few questions that we got uh, from our audience, uh, things that they were they were interested in. So, if you write a book for the general public uh, or even for business, but let's say you think it has potential. Uh, would you recommend getting a, uh, a literary agent? And if so, uh, what should that look like? Well, yes, <laughs> I say with some reluctance. My, my partner is a literary agent. We spend a lot of time arguing with each other about our respective businesses. Um, if you hope to be published by a commercial trade house like Penguin or Simon & Schuster, they will only deal with literary agents. So you would absolutely have to find one. Um, university presses, not so much. We do deal with them, but we're 
uh, perfectly delighted and prefer uh, to deal directly with the authors. And finding, you know, finding an agent is almost as challenging as finding a publisher. I would say, you know, you should speak to uh, friends of, and colleagues who are working with somebody already for a recommendation, or perhaps this is never hurts to look in the front of a book uh, that feels like the kind of book you're writing and see who they acknowledge as their agent. And that at least shows that it's somebody who's interested in your kind of work. I would echo what Ellen said. Um, if you're going for that straight ahead traditional trade publishing route, you're going to need the agent. Um, I've published books. I'm not necessarily looking for the agent. For the, my authors that do have agents, though, I think it's only helped them. I think it's only helped them as far as defining as defining the market, making making sure that the material that the publishers want gets in front of them. You know, they're they're I think it, it speeds up the process for the uh for the potential author um uh, a bit more. So when I've um dealt with books that have come in through agents and stuff like that, I've always known that the 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 proposal is then going to be um a bit more polished. I'm going to be able to speak, I think have a bit more of a the conduit, I think that's going to be able to speak a little bit more about the uh, the market, and maybe they've even educated the author up front a bit more, so the author appears um, better in front of the publisher. Got it. All right, last question, and I know we're already over time, so if everyone could just, if we could just keep this uh, short, is um, biggest difference, you would say, uh, between, you know, when you're considering whether to, if you are considering to publish either, you know, let's say a business book or an academic business book or a trade book, um, sort of the advantages and disadvantages of working with a university publisher or more um, versus more of a trade publisher or more, versus more of a business publisher. Meaning we not we meaning there are I guess there are different options. You can publish a trade book with a university publisher, or you can publish a trade book with a you know sort of general publisher. And, and, and same holds true uh, for business books. It can be more with Rutledge, or uh, you could go with you know maybe maybe a, 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 a different um, a different type of publisher. So what are what are some of the differences that that scholars should be looking out for? Well, it won't surprise you to hear that I think you should always publish with university presses. Um, of course, there's more money to be made with a commercial house. You know, the money would be paid up front as an advance, even if it doesn't earn out. It's uh, significantly more than you would get at a university press. But a university press in the long run really treats you better because we don't we don't just publish a book, it's not one and done. You know, a book stays with you, you're promoting it for years and years to come, and you're hoping to have a relationship with the author so that you can sort of be their publisher for the, their whole career, you know, from the dissertation up to their capstone book. It's a different experience. It's a much more uh, intimate experience, I think. Michael? For me, since I oversee Productivity Press, which is an imprint of Routledge, where Routledge is primarily academic, but I'm more focused on the on, on the business side. What I like about it is that since I'm focused more on professional publishing, I'm sort of building books that have a very long tail because a lot of times they get embedded in organizations as far as adoptions for training and things like that, as opposed to, and again, I don't, I don't say this in a as a flippant way, as opposed to say maybe a trade book where it's like, okay, that trade book came off press, you promote the hell out of it for the first three months, then it goes right to a backlist where here you're looking at like, well, no, this book came off press and no, it didn't make a gigantic splash. It didn't start selling like crazy within the first month, but you know what? Nine months later, two years later, three years later, wow, we're still seeing very consistent sales from this professional book because a lot of these companies have bought into it and they're now using it for training. And now we're ready to do a second edition because the author has learned a lot more in his or her career. And, um, and now we're going to, we're going to, we're going to move on to that. So I think it, that's why, I, that's where I, the value that I think I provide to folks who have then become professional authors where it's not that, okay. You know, Cause the trade book again is more of like that. You're you know, it's like you're fishing, you're throwing it on the deck and then you're just, you know, you're cutting it up and then you're moving on, <laughs> you know, so it's, it's really a bit different. You're lo yeah. and, no, it's a really interesting point because you're kind of, and I wonder if this sort of hints towards the future of publication of, of di books, seeing books as dynamic entities and not just you publish it once and then it's one and done, but rather I love the fact that they're, that 
a lot of your authors are getting feedback and then actually doing a second edition, which which um, you know, which which adds hopefully to the first one and, and and maybe corrects errors, but also just makes a more sophisticated view, especially sort of sort of forces the authors to listen to their audience's reactions to the book, in addition to just publishing it and then, you know, saying and just going on the book tour and talking about how great it is, they actually, you know, are getting active feedback. So that's that's really right. That's right. Really yeah. No, I again, I, I think it, I think there is a certain mindset there, because for myself, when I first started acquiring, it was, oh, I acquire books. I my job is to acquire books where now I feel in 2021, I am a content provider. I don't know what the medium is going to be, but I am here to assemble and gear content. And however, whether that's someone reading like an old, you know, an old style book on paper or some type of chip implanted into their head, <laughs> it's still the content that I'm, that I'm, that I'm providing, that I'm assembling and providing. Right. Brilliant. All right. Well, I, I want to, again, we've run over time. So I, I thank you very, very much for your time and for your insights. It's really been a fascinating discussion today. Uh, if there are scholars who are looking for additional help, you know, preparing their proposals, either for Michael or Alan, you're welcome to be in touch with them directly. If you feel like you need an extra sort of step beforehand, someone to go over professional uh, advice, uh, feel free to be in touch with me. I'm happy. I've been doing this, you know, uh, uh, for, for the entire year now, really, after all of these, uh, after all the talks. And I've learned a thing or two, hopefully, from all of our wonderful guests. Um, so feel free to be in touch. Um, and uh, and thank you. Thank you for taking time out of your busy day to, to, to join us and to participate. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at future events. Thank you. All, all right. right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Alan and Michael. Appreciate your time. Take bye -bye. care. All right. Bye-bye.